Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and today I have an amazing special guest who is going to talk to us all about trademarks. Now, you guys know that with brand registry on Amazon, trademarks are required. And so, of course, we want to have several different experts on here. I know years ago we had someone else on, and we're going to talk again about trademarks. So, Anita, welcome to the show. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Christian. Hello, everyone. Um, so I guess you want me to tell me by bi my bio? Yeah, well, right? I just want to say, introduce yourself. Tell us how you got into trademarking. I know that you, you, you work a lot primarily with Amazon sellers. So really excited to have you here today. And just tell us a little bit about your background, how you know about Amazon and um, trademarking specifically. Yeah, so I've been uh, in the trademark industry since 99, and I've been working in various law firms. Uh, but in 2017, uh, after I had my third son born, I decided that uh, I could no longer commute for long hours, and it was time for me, you know, to open up my own firm. So that's how uh, Trademark Angel was born, and pretty much it will be five years uh, in May, um, and it's going uh, pretty well. Um, um, I decided to work with Amazon clients by accident. Uh, because in 2017, uh, when I started, Amazon started to introduce the brand registry requirements. And it just so happened that, you know, some potential clients asked us uh, about brand registry. And I started reading about that. And it just, I guess it's a coincidence, like many things in life. I love your story on how like you, you know, you've been working as a successful lawyer and all of these different um, firms and then just decided to start your own because you wanted to work from home. Are you still working from home? And I was I was actually working yeah I was working as a trademark agent, uh for like um like in a law firm and then I was working uh, from home, but still was working for somebody, uh and I I was afraid to open uh, my own business I guess because I thought okay I mean there is no I mean I will not succeed I mean there are so many firms already, uh so what else what what can I do that would be different, uh but then when I had my third son um somehow I thought that it was time to, you know, overcome my own fears. Um, I ha had a business before, but it wasn't a uh, trademark related. Mm -hmm. That's that really very new. That's really awesome. And true. The fact that like, I know, I think a lot of people think, oh, you know, even with Amazon, they're thinking, oh, there's so many sellers, there's no room mm -hmm. for me, or there's no room for my brand. And the reality is you can make it what you want to make it just like in your firm, you decided that, you know, you could specialize in something like trademarking and specifically for Amazon sellers. And that's kind of how you carve your own um, kind of niche out of the market. So that's really, really awesome. So I know you've worked in multiple countries and I know that trademark angel, um, for those that didn't catch that quickly, um, Anita is the co-founder or founder of, um, sorry, founder of Trademark Angel, and mm -hmm. they do online services to be able to help you with all of your trademark needs. Um, and so we'll get to, there'll be links and stuff like that at the end of the show. Um, but like, let's just talk overall about um, like why, you know, first of all, why I'm going to go really quickly into why mm -hmm. we need brand registry. And I know you can comment on this as far as why this is so important. Brand registry, regardless if like, I like, I think a lot of people come to the table and they think that like having a brand means that like you have to be like a household name, you know, like everybody has to know your brand. It's gotta be Nike or it's gotta be like, you know, brands that everybody, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, things that everybody knows about. But just having a brand is creating a brand, even if it's just for your Amazon store or for your Amazon bundles, to be able to have a brand gives you so much protection and so much more um, resources to be able to use in the brand registry, brand enhanced content, putting on videos, putting up even a whole entire storefront dedicated to your brand. It's a really, really important step to take and it doesn't have to be really expensive or complicated. It's just something you have to sit down and think through for a while. Um, so what do you feel like the benefits of brand registry for some of the clients that you've dealt with have, have been for them? Yeah, there are numerous benefits and it's, I, I think it's a necessary tool actually to succeed on Amazon. Uh, it's not optional in my opinion, you have to have it uh, because it allows you, for example, I shop on Amazon a lot. And the first thing I do, let's say I'm looking at something, let's say I'm buying, a, I don't know, swimwear for myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's say I don't like it particularly, but I like the presentation. I like uh, this particular seller. So I click on brand and I want to see the store. I want to see what else they buy, what else they say they sell. 
So I want to browse their own store. So when I click on the brand and I see some random results, I know the, this seller doesn't have brand registry, so it's quite obvious. But when I click on the brand and I see the own store uh, and I like what I see, I may buy two or three things. So it immediately increases your income. Uh, I mean, it may not be obvious, but it does. Well, and uh, what you mentioned just now too was a trust factor. It was a, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a credibility. So if you click mm -hmm. on someone's brand and then you realize they have 25 other products with the same brand, you immediately establish your credibility with your consumer because you, you think, oh, if they have one swimsuit that's like this, how many other ones? What are my other options? And then when people click their brand store, then they get to see all the other products, even if they're not all swimwear, maybe they carry oh. leggings, maybe they carry shirts or bras or something else. And you can say, oh, these are multiple things I can buy from this brand, not just this one thing. So it also gives you the trust and credibility with consumers consumers. Yeah, because you can read the reviews, right? If you see, oh, yes, they have lots of reviews and obviously it's an established brand. So you feel like buying from them. So, so for me, it's the first thing I do, actually. So I know it's I'm probably not the only one. Uh, and, and another thing is that when you have brand registry, you can you can have a really nice layout. You can put all, put all these nice buttons, a nice description, uh, like more photographs and videos and people do check them. Uh, so that's uh, another thing. And the last, uh, well, not the last, like one other benefit is that, uh, you know, sometimes sellers have hijackers. So when somebody sells from under your listing and they put a lower um, price and they pretty much hijack your listing. So hijackers also check brand registry. So that's the first thing they do as well. They click on the brand and they see, okay, are they in the brand registry? If they see that, okay, this seller is in the brand registry, it's less likely that they will actually hijack your listing. Because, well, most likely you will be removed. But they don't know like in what country you registered your trademark, but they say, okay, yes, they have brand registry. Okay, let's let's find somebody who just began, you know, selling who is like novice. Uh, this person is probably too experienced. So to me, that that would be my logic. And I know that's that's the case. That's what's uh, been happening. So those people who are in the brand registry, they don't have, uh, they don't seem to have new hijackers. Uh, but if you already have hijackers, obviously they will not go away. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think you're right with that. I think it really does. Like when people are, you know, there's tons of people out there, whether we want to like it or not, um, to that are just looking for an easy way. They're looking for an okay. easy listing to copy or an easy product to copy so that they don't have to do all the hard work. But when you, when you're brand registered, then you're protecting your listings from that. Now, it doesn't mean you're not going to have problems. I've had a couple of hijackers attempt to jump on my listings and Amazon has been, especially in the last, uh, since the beginning of 2022, they've changed the language of how you can report a violation. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if we can talk about that for a minute. Um, as far as so I have brand registry, and I noticed that there was a hijacker on my listing, someone was listing my product and, and it, you know, under the same listing. And when I went to report the violation, then Amazon asks specific questions, they want you to define how this person is violating your trademark. And mm -hmm. so maybe we can touch on that for a bit, because as you're reporting problems, one of the things Amazon asks is to, for you to clearly define how they're violating your trademark. So in an instance where I am selling a product, so just pretend that this is my product and I've got my brand name on my box and everything else. And then someone else decides they can sell the same thing. How is it that what what makes that a violation if they're jumping on your listing? Well, first of all, uh, to really remove hijackers, you need to have a registered trademark. So most people don't really realize this. There is a difference between being in the brand registry and being able to remove hijackers. So just because you are in the brand registry doesn't mean you can remove hijackers. So you can enroll in the brand registry with a pending trademark. So let's say you just filed it and you will be in the brand registry, you will get access to all the features. And most likely you will not have so many hijackers, but if you already have one, uh, to, to be able to re remove the hijacker with Amazon, your trademark has to be registered. So that's why it's really important to file it early. Uh, but I mean, you can remove a hijacker when somebody sells uh, a similar product um, using your trademark on the product or pretending that it's your product. So yes, you have to be able to explain that. So that's why uh, it, it's really important not to sell generic products. So let's say if your product is a, like a cell phone case and there is no trademark on the case and somebody else sells like a similar well, cell phone case, 
well, it's, it's, it's really difficult to prove that there is really any problem with that. Uh, but if, if they actually, let's, so let's say if you put ABC trademark on your cell phone case and somebody else actually made an effort to put the same trademark, your trademark that's already registered on their case, that's a trademark infringement. And then Amazon will help you to remove the hijacker. So there is a difference, uh, but obviously, Many people try to remove hijackers with a pendant trademark and they don't succeed. And then they, they're surprised, well, like, why? Uh, well, that's because, I mean, it takes a long time to register a trademark. So you can file it really quickly, get access to brand registry, start selling. But then the process uh, in the US, for example, takes about 18 months right now. So, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you can still try and you can uh, try and scare the seller. <laughs> You can still ask Amazon. Sometimes they do remove uh, hijackers because obviously it's um, well. It depends on the like on the um, on the person who works on your case, but it will not happen automatically. Uh, and sometimes they do remove hijackers when you have a pendant trademark. Like we had situations like this, but it's not common. Uh, and but you sometimes you get lucky. Yeah, for sure. And you know, there, there's some things like, you know, I, I noticed someone on mine. And so then I went to report a violation about that ASIN. And then they asked specific questions like, um, did you do a test purchase to make sure that this person is violating your trademark? And is it, and that's, I guess, the question, uh, another, so, so a lot of audience members have asked this question, so hopefully we can, we can get to the bottom of it, at least with this, is, okay, so I have uh, a, my trademarked product or my trademark brand, it's completely registered, it's not pending, and I put up a listing, and now someone else is selling that very same thing, and one of the questions Amazon asked is, did you do a test purchase to see if they've violated your trademark? And so you purchase that item and I purchased the item from the other competitor and then realize that um, they don't have my packaging. Clearly they don't have my packaging because I make my packaging. So then we can report that as a violation because they're saying that they're, they're selling my product, mm -hmm. but they don't have the same consumer packaging that I have. So if they were selling what was inside the box, but not mm -hmm. with the box, then that's a violation of my trademark because my trademark includes my branding mm -hmm. on my packaging. Is that correct? Well, yeah. So here uh, you, you don't actually need to make a, like a test purchase. So hopefully they're not going to ask, are they, I'm not sure they ask for this every time. Do they? Um, they, they have I, been I, in, in this year, they have been asking like when you, when you report a violation, a trademark violation to like in brand during mm -hmm. your brand dashboard of Amazon, when you go to report a violation, they ask you several questions. I'm tr actually trying to find it right now on Amazon. Uh, well, I, I don't think you need to make a test purchase. We had clients who've been uh, able to uh, remove hijackers without any test purchase, because sometimes, I mean, it takes time to make a test purchase. Like you, you, you buy, and then and uh, you, you actually need to use somebody else's account to buy. So it takes time. And then what if you have multiple hijackers? So it will, sometimes it takes a long time. So we, you can just say no. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yes, if they, uh, if they sell under your trademark, so pretty much they're pretending to sell the same product. And actually, uh, if clients get something that they think they're buying from you. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's say they click, uh, they click a buy uh, to buy and the hijacker has the buy box. So they actually bought their product thinking it's your product. They will leave negative reviews that, that may impact you. Yeah. So yes, obviously they're trying to sell something that uh, they're trying to sell a product that's inferior. Mm -hmm. So yes, in this case, I mean, it shouldn't, I mean, it shouldn't be allowed to do that, but um, I mean, we, we know that Amazon encourages as many sellers as possible. Uh, so that's why it's, I mean, to be able to succeed in removing the hijacker, uh, it, it's it's important to have a, like a registered trademark, uh, and it's important to put the the trademark name on the product and or on the packaging. I mean, don't skip that step. And what we also recommend is to sell uh, a kit if possible, because that's much more difficult to duplicate. So you don't just sell a cell phone case; you sell a cell phone case, um, some I don't know instructions or like a pen or like a notebook, and it's like a fancy kit now. So it, May, it may cost a little bit more, but it's much more difficult to sell something similar because it will uh, it will take more effort. Yes, and I'm trying to pull up these questions because um, I think that this is this is how we do this. Um, hold mm -hmm. on, I'm gonna search for it and then see. 
to, to write to I, I'm gonna see if I can show it on here. Okay, so intellectual property. Um, so yeah, I guess that's what I'm thinking of, like with bundles specifically, because with bundles, the trouble is that people have multiple brands represented in the same package. So mm -hmm. then they they there's different rules when it comes to Amazon and branding and bundling. They have specific policies and rules about that. And so a lot of clients have been asking, okay, well, how how am I not violating someone else's trademark by including their brand into my kit? So can we, is there any clarity you can give us on that as far as like, if I'm putting three different items together in the same box and I'm calling it, you know, the newborn baby, you know, gift set yeah. for boys. Yeah. 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 Well, in a Gerber onesie and I'm using mm -hmm. maybe a nook nook for like a, you know, a blanket or something like that. So I'm using multiple brands, but mm -hmm. my brand is, you know, Kristen's gift baskets. And so mm -hmm. I have trademarked Kristen's gift baskets as my brand. And what I do in Kristen's gift baskets is use other brands to create an awesome gift basket for a specific niche. So newborn baby. Yeah, baby. yeah, yeah. No, that's perfectly allowed because you're you're selling you're selling uh, like a gift basket that contains uh, different brands. So you're actually providing a service. Mm -hmm. uh of like assembling those gift baskets and maybe have like a subscription mm -hmm. uh so you can put your trademark on the actual gift basket on the package and on the wrapper or on the i don't know instructions or like manual mm -hmm. but actual products are something else yeah that's perfectly fine but you're not trademarking those products they're already right. trademarked you're trademarking this service of like subscription service or like membership service uh or you're selling those gift baskets yeah like it's it's like it's a it's a bundle so your product is not those individual individual products inside it's like the service that you do when you collect them and assemble them in a way that you know uh people like yes because you do their work for them so you do you're providing a service here yes that's awesome. Thank you for that clarity, because I think a lot of people, you know, and just hearing it also from an attorney and not just me talking really helps to, to um, validate that because that is the actual, you know, process by which this happens is that you're doing a service for someone by collecting really awesome products, putting them into a box and then that, or a box or bag or gift basket or whatever it is. And then you're saying here, you know, you're welcome. Here's this service I provided for you. You don't have to go shopping to buy all of these things. You could, we put them all in in one place. So, um, so when it was coming to like reporting a violation, you know, those are the things I think that, that we're getting people and I can't seem to find the exact wording of some of these. So we'll just let that go for now. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, the idea there is just like the, the idea of protection, because I know that some people, um, you know, will still try and hijack your listing, even if you have brand registry. And then the language by which Amazon saying is to report that is that they have mm -hmm. had to violate your trademark in some ways. So can you give us a couple of examples of a violation of a trademark? So if I have a trademark, Kristen's gift baskets, and I have a logo and I put that on all my packaging, if someone creates the same bundle without my packaging, that would be a violation of the trademark, correct? Well, what do you mean by packaging? I mean, the, what's so let's just get something right. So your trademark is what appears on the packaging or on the product. So that's your trademark. Mm -hmm. uh, your trademark is not an actual, um, well, the actual products themselves. Right. So anyone can sell like what's inside uh, the basket. Mm -hmm. So let's say anyone can sell soap. So let's say you sell soap and candles in a nice gift basket uh, and you put uh, Kristen's, uh, I don't know. Gift baskets. <laughs> sure. Yeah, well, Kristen's uh, baskets. Mm -hmm. Uh, and your so your trademark is Kristen's baskets, for example. I mean, it's not. I know it's not a very right. good trademark name, but right. let's say that's your trademark. So if somebody sells um, gift basket with let's say uh, soap and candles, uh, and they call it uh, Natalia's gift baskets, I mean that's not a problem because I mean obviously the trademark is different. Right. What I mean is, if someone jumps on my listing that's trademarked as Kristen's oh yes, yes, basket, yes. I mean that should be. And then be, they I mean, don't have the packaging, then that mm -hmm. is a violation of the trademark. Yes, uh, the, the, by packaging you mean uh, the trademark name? Well, no, a packaging means like here's an example. Yeah. So I put all of my products in this mm -hmm, box, mm -hmm. in this box. Yeah, yeah. Has so the, the brand. So if mm -hmm. someone sells the the contents that are inside, but they don't include the packaging, 
yet they're still calling it Kristen's basket. Well, yes, of course, of yes. course. Yes, I mean, so that's, yeah, because hijackers can come in many forms. I mean, they may actually put the trademark, they may not put the trademark, but they're using your listing. So when people buy, they still see your brand name. So they're thinking they're buying your product, but they're actually being misled uh, and they're buying somebody else's product thinking it's your product. So yes, of course. So the uh, bottom line here for everyone to remember, because these are, I'm kind of answering questions people have submitted about mm -hmm. trademarks and things. And the bottom line here is using your custom packaging with your trademark name on it is extremely important to report violations. If you don't, if you put something in a clear poly bag, but your brand, you're, you have registered your brand, then someone could come along. Here's just like another example. This is just a clear poly bag. Mm -hmm. You can put something in and I can't, it doesn't say Kristen's baskets on it anywhere. It's just plain. So if you just put product in here and there's nothing with your brand name on it and there's nothing to differentiate it from someone else's generic three products, then they're not violating your trademark and you can't report it. So it's really, really important to create your custom packaging with your trademark mm -hmm. on it and include it with everything you sell. So I wanted to make sure that we had that that really clear with that. Now let's get into specifics about trademarks, right? Like when it comes to trademarking, like do you recommend or do you think that people should attempt it on their own? Is it like a cumbersome process that people really can do on their own? Or do you more suggest working with, with an attorney at that level? Well, you can really register a trademark yourself. Uh, you can do anything yourself. Uh, but it will take time uh, to learn how to do this right. And there are many mistakes you can make uh, when you file a trademark. So for example, uh, it's really important to do clearance search before you file. So you need to make sure that your trademark is registrable. And that's like, for example, what we do we never file without a proper trademark search. But people who file themselves, sometimes they miss it or they don't do it accurately. Uh, so when you do a trademark search, let's say there is a conflict. There are many ways how you can avoid the problem if you know about this problem before. If you don't know about this problem and you file a trademark, and let's say you already filed saying that you've been using the trademark, uh, you may run into serious problems. You may get a cease and desist letter. Uh, secondly, you may list the products that you sell incorrectly. And there are many ways how we can list them incorrectly. I know it seems okay, what's so difficult about that? But yes, you may do this incorrectly. Uh, and I'll give you like, I'll give an example that I really like. Uh, actually, we filed a trademark, so it wasn't the person who filed herself, but she told us I'm going to sell uh, forks and spoons and they fall in class eight, class eight of goods and, uh, goods and services. So yes, we put forks and spoons. We asked her like, what else are you going to sell? Yes, forks and spoons. Uh, and then she, um, the person disappeared for a long time. Uh, and then uh, we've been setting her reminders, uh, your trademark is now allowed. Uh, we need to prove to the trademarks office that now you sell the, your products. Uh, and she sends us a picture of like a spade, you know, shovel that you, you use in gardening. And it also belongs to class eight, surprisingly. And we tell her, no, we need to see a picture of uh, forks and spoons. And she tells us, but we filed for class eight, didn't we? Uh, yes, we filed for uh, forks and spoons that fall in class eight, but that particular product wasn't included. So what people very often do when they file, they see um, a product that they know they're going to sell and they just include that particular product, but then they start selling another product that is not listed in their trademark application. And that's a fatal error because you can't really add products after the filing. And it's, it's an error that you can really easily make when you just file yourself because you don't think about all these little details. You don't realize about the significance of putting everything that you think you will be selling in the next two years uh, in the trademark application. Uh, but unfortunately, when you file yourself, you don't know what you don't know. So you just see it seems pretty easy and you file. Another uh, error that people make uh, when they file themselves, you know how in the US, uh, you need to use your trademark in order to register. Uh, so many people, um, they don't really sell their products yet on Amazon, but they don't want to, they just want to make it as easy as possible. So they Photoshop uh, the photograph. So they pretend that their trademark is already on the product and they submit Photoshopped photographs. Um, and that's, uh, that's really bad because your uh, USPTO has a system to detect uh, when um, a photograph has been photoshopped and they will audit you and they will really want to see that you you have been selling your product so if you haven't it's it's a big problem 
So it's, it's not a good idea to do that at all, not for the trademarks office and actually not for Amazons anymore, because uh, when you apply for brand registry, they do want to see your photographs. So they want to ensure that you have a real um, product showing your trademark. And um, well, maybe six months ago, they were okay about Photoshop pictures, but not anymore. I mean, they have been rejecting Photoshopped photographs. Uh, so it's not a good idea to Photoshop them, but I know people like shortcuts. Of so course. Still do of that. course, everybody is always trying to cut corners, both with time and money and efforts. But the reality is, if you do the hard work up front and just um, comply, then you will have the reward of good registered trademark when it comes to the end. Now, what are some of the requirements for like an application for like a word mark versus like a design mark? And do you have to have both? And what is the what are the benefits to one or the other? Yeah, so when possible, it's always better to file for a word mark. So just standard characters without any logo, because it gives you uh, like broader protection and it gives you more flexibility. You can use such a trademark uh, with any logo. Really, you're not limited. But sometimes um, those trademarks are less registrable because there are similar trademarks. So when we do a trademark search, uh, first of all, we always check if the word mark is registrable. But we also ask our client to send us the logo. Uh, if the trademark is problematic, we recommend to file for a combined mark. So that's the uh, word mark plus the logo together. It's called a combined mark. And such trademark is always more registrable uh, because it's more unique. It has a unique logo, well, hopefully. Uh, but it's also less flexible because you can't really break it up. You have to use it exactly as you filed it. So there is a limitation. So it's more registrable, but you can't really change the font and the logo. You can't change the position of the elements. So you're really stuck with the logo. So if you're not happy with it, it's not a good idea to file for the logo. And uh, just one other thing I wanted to mention. So there is a word mark. Uh, there is a combined logo, but there is also just a logo, just a picture, an image. And that is not enough for brand registry, by the way. So mm -hmm. your trademark has to have some text in it. You have to be able to read it. That's great advice because actually that's something I'd never heard. I, I didn't oh. know that you could only just, you know, I registered my very first trademark as just a word mark and it did have mm -hmm. a logo, but y'all, we learned something new every day. I had no idea that it was easier to register a trademark that had both a logo and text, mm -hmm. but also just to, to reiterate that, you know, the Amazon requires at least a word mark. And then if you did a work word and design mark, a combination mark, then that would be okay too. Yeah. Um, but if it's just a picture, yeah, uh, let's say it's just a tulip. You can, there is no, there is no text in it. You can't really use right. that for brand registry because how will you like, it doesn't say anything, right? There is no right. text, but yeah, some people don't realize that and they, <laughs> file for a logo and thinking, okay, why can't I use it for brand registry? Yeah, that's great advice. Um, are there are certain things to avoid um, when it comes to choosing a brand name or a trademark because of the, the different rules and restrictions, like how trademarkable is something? You know, I, I've actually personally, in my experience, I've had two trademarks now be like rejected because they were too subjective, I think, or something like it wasn't like specific enough descriptive. Mm -hmm. That's right. I'm sorry. Um, and so I've, you know, been in that and that's with working with attorneys still, you know, I had, I have a lot of proof of in use and logos and things, but yet still there was one of my trademarks that was still rejected. Due, it was supplemental register now because it can be supplementally registered, but it wasn't something I could use for Amazon because it was. Yes. Rejected. Yes. Yes. So descriptive trademark is one that describes uh, products, for example, like cold and creamy uh, for ice cream, or like by Bank of New York, so that's descriptive, like hot and crispy for baked products, so that would be descriptive as well, because I mean, there is no unique element here, there is nothing distinctive, uh, there is nothing that makes it yours. Uh, and such trademarks are registrable in the US, but yes, so they can only be registered on the supplemental register. Uh, so when you just file a trademark, obviously you never admit that it's descriptive. So when you file it, you file it on the principal register so you can still use it for brand registry. Uh, but when the trademark is finally registered on the, uh, on the supplemental register, I mean, Amazon will remove you from brand registry eventually. Yeah. Uh, because I mean, such trademarks, uh, because they're descriptive, descriptive trademarks pretty much can be used by anyone. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously there are exceptions, like for example, Best Buy. I mean, that's a descriptive yeah. trademark, but has that has become distinctive because it's so well known that when you say Best Buy, what do you think about? Right, the electronic superstore. Yeah, yeah you don't think store. about, okay, that's the best deal. You think yeah. about the store because yeah. people associate the name with that particular store. But usually when you're a small seller, no one will associate cold and creamy with your particular ice cream. They will just think about uh, some cold and creamy ice cream. Yes. Uh, so that's why it's not a good, it's not a good name. Uh, but you can easily turn a descriptive trademark into a distinctive trademark by adding some unique and creative word like fabulicious or cha-cha, I don't know, red moon. Mm-hmm. Uh, or you can uh, take your uh, first name, last name, take the first part and, co- and create like a unique word that doesn't exist. Like, I don't know, Chris, Chris yeah. like I'm Chris, 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 yes. I mean, so yeah, so here we have a like our Ostrand. I mean, there are two unique right. uh, trademarks here. I actually or like spelling the, your or, name backwards, like mine's Nitzirk. Yeah. If you spell yeah. my name backwards, it's Nitzirk, but no one ever says that. So that could, that's a unique and different word that you yes. could use. Um, now and when it's, it comes it's yours. To, right. But when it comes to those unique words and things like that, like the, the problem I suppose with that is that like, if you're the, it's tough to have brand recognition when your brand is kind of gobbledygook, you know what I mean? So I guess it depends <laughs> on your, it depends on your intentions with your brand. If you're just creating uh, Amazon listings and you don't, don't have any intention mm-hmm. of going to um, big box stores or heading to retail real or genuine brick and mortar retail with your items. And you're really just trying to create a bundle brand for Amazon so that you can create unique products, then using a name like Nitzirk or putting things, you know, acronyms, our first one is very similar to that. It's an, it's like an acronym for like the people that were in our business. So um, we use like the first and last letters Mm -hmm. of their name and we created an acronym and then we just Mm -hmm. use like the, you know, another generic word to go along with it. So that was accepted without any problems because Mm -hmm. it was kind of a made up name. Um, and so that can be helpful. So I have, I, you know, I've had several clients trademark several different things that um, have things like shop or mercantile or mm-hmm. um, store in them to mm-hmm. where it's mm-hmm. like you could have blue moon ice cream, but then mm-hmm. you can also have blue moon gift shop. You know, those are, you can register both trademarks uh, because one of them is distinctive for blue moon ice cream, and then Mm -hmm. you have blue moon gift shop. So, um, you know, using extra words um, like that, as that also increases your chances of being approved the first time. Well, when you look at, when you select a trademark, you have to think, I mean, so there are like a few things you have to think about. You have to make sure the trademark is good from the marketing perspective, that it's recognizable. So that's why it's good if uh, a trademark consists of two words. One is descriptive, like for example, trademark angel, one is descriptive trademark. Okay, yes, we sell uh, trademark registration or something that has to do with trademarks. The other word is unique, angel. So here you have uh, like a a good trademark that's registrable. and it's good from the marketing perspective. It's really easy to market it. But when the trademark is, yes, googly gook, like mm-hmm. it's really difficult to stand out because it will take you years before people start to recognize the name. So yes, it's a good idea. Uh, whether it makes it stronger, not necessarily, because if, uh, if the second word is descriptive, it's given really little weight, uh, but it's still given some weight. So yes, I mean, it's, it's, it makes uh, the chances stronger, but not significantly. Um, but it's still better than uh, one word, let's put it this way. Mm-hmm. But it, it's given like really little weight. So it's, it's better from the marketing um, perspective, from the SEO, right? So if yeah. you have a website, you want it to come up. Yes, you have to think about that. That's really important. You can't disregard it uh, from the domain name perspective. Uh, but it, it, and also it does... for packaging, right? I mean, you're going yeah. to have to create some sort of packaging with this word on it someplace, or like, I mean, let's think of something super simple, like the target or Nike, you know, they have a specific logo and then a, a way to describe that Nike mm-hmm. target, one word, things like that. But like, that's what I mean. If you've got like a, um, X, Y, Z, L, T, 
trading, you know, and that's your name, then you're going to have to print that somewhere. And so you want it to look nice or at least make some sort of sense or acronyms are still okay. You could have ABC conglomerates or, you know, whatever you're making up here, but like making sure that it's going to translate to package, because if you have your brand registry and your trademark, and yet you don't put that on your packaging or it doesn't translate to a packaging, then no, you're not going to be able to report violations anyway. So making sure when you're choosing using a trademark name that you're using something that is non-descriptive. It's very unique. It can be made up. Like I know I, I saw one in the example of the USPTO when I was looking through things that like mm -hmm. they use like ridiculous things like banana tires. Well, because banana and tires don't na yeah, naturally go yeah. together. And so it's very unique because people think, oh, head on down to banana tires to get your car fixed or whatever. That makes sense because it is unique. And of course you can't trademark tires or I can't say best tire company because that's descriptive, but then you can say banana tires and all of a sudden right. you have a very unique and distinctive brand that not only you can use so fun marketing, but you can also set yourself apart because it is unique and different that people remember it. So um, whether you're, and I'm just speaking specifically to our audience here of wholesale bundlers, mm -hmm. don't spend too much time on this, especially if you don't if you're just creating multiple products and multiple bundles for Amazon and you're trying to earn your income that way and you have no interest in going bigger with your products into you know brick and mortar stores or even having your own website, keep it simple, keep it maybe creative or unique or something that just is easily translatable on a package and also is unique enough to be trademarked, yet you don't have to get super fancy with it. I mean, think about it. Target, they have a target, they have red, they have a white, you know what I mean? That's all there is. Yeah, yeah. And so I don't know how they got target to be, when it comes to descriptiveness, how did they trademark target? I always still wonder. But it's that. not descriptive. It's right. suggestive. I mean, I mean, they don't sell targets really. Right. <laughs> It's just I mean, like a it's, store. It's, it's suggestive of, okay, that store is your target. That's where you should go to buy things, but yeah. they don't sell targets. Right. So that's why it's not, it's a really good trademark, but it's not descriptive. It's suggestive. Yeah. So it pushes you to go there uh, and buy something, uh, but it's, it's a good name uh, and it's suggestive. Suggestive trademarks are registrable. Yes. Awesome. Now, um, one thing, are, are there specific things to avoid when we're, we're looking for and or filing a trademark um, or even choosing a trademark name? Like what are a couple of top things to like just stay clear of these things? Well, it's uh, quite obvious, but maybe people still do this. Avoid uh, trademarks that have been registered. Uh, so let's say if a trademark is registered for T-shirts and you really like that particular trademark name, if it's registered, stay away from this name or don't don't try to change one letter to slightly misspell it because it will not be enough. Mm -hmm. So even though it's not identical, it will still be very similar. So it will still be a problem. Uh, so it's really important to do the trademark search to see uh, what trademarks are filed, what trademarks are registered, like what trademarks are out there on internet used so that you, you stay away from uh, these names. Uh, because it's really uh, easy to pick a name and you like it, but it's been taken by somebody else and you invested a lot of time and money into something that's actually not yours. And then you have to rebrand. Uh, <laughs> that happened to a restaurant, a local restaurant with us. And we, I, because of all my knowledge with trademarks, I really laughed about it. And I thought that cost them thousands of dollars. So right in my town, they opened a brand new like breakfast brunch place. They're only mm -hmm. open from seven to three, six days a week. And it's like a little bit more of a high end, like breakfast brunch place. And they used to be called um, the broken yolk. And mm -hmm. I thought that was a really clever name. Everything, everybody flocked to this place. They have great food. It was awesome. But in about six months after they opened the store, or maybe, maybe about a year, uh, they changed their name and they had to take down their sign and they yeah. changed all of their menus and every, I mean, they even had like um, really nice coffee mugs that said broken yolk and all this stuff. 
And then we found out, like we asked the owner, cause we go there once a week and we asked them what happened. This used to be the broken yolk. They changed it to the bread and yolk. They had no idea that they were, that there was a chain breakfast chain restaurant called the broken yolk and they were violating the, They got sued for violating their trademark. Yeah. Well, people don't do their research. I mean, we've had like so many instances when it happened, like mm -hmm. another thing I forgot to mention. So when you, when you are just a reseller, so let's say you just sell generic products. Sometimes you don't have a trademark. Sometimes uh, people come to us and say, I want to register my trademark, but I, I, don't, I don't have one. So how do I register? Can I register my company name? No, because it's not really affixed to your products. It's not on your package and it's not on your products. I mean, you just sell generic products. There is nothing to register. Or the name is so uh, generic, like cell, phone, uh, cell phones and accessories, there is nothing to register because it's like devoid of any unique character and there is no distinctive element so there is absolutely nothing to register uh, but when you when when you just begin selling or you begin you, you start a small business sometimes you don't think about a unique trademark uh, and sometimes that causes a problem because somebody may start using a similar name and you can't stop them because well it's it's simply generic so that's yeah. why it's really important to pick a, a name that's unique yes. um yeah Awesome. Well, th th that's such great, great advice. Now, um, you know, what is the best way to get started working with you guys? Because although I do, I have done a couple of, I've done it both ways. I did my <laughs> own trademark in the first beginning and that one was fine. Um, but then I've also uh, registered three more with attorneys. And so uh, that's part, part is a lot easier because everyone, you know, your company and other companies and other firms have basically do the work for you. You just submit the specimens and the descriptions and things like that. Um, Okay, wait, what, I did have one more question before we get to how people can work mm -hmm. with you because they should. Um, but another question I had was, I'm trying to think, I just lost it for a second. <laughs> it wasn't written down, but then I was like, oh wait, I remember this question I had. Um, when it comes to the trademarks, let me think. Oh, well, I guess it just escaped me. I guess maybe I'll, I'll, okay. I'll text it to you or something some other time. But, sure. Um, so registering your trademark for for this particular now does your company help people develop a trademark if they don't have an idea say they have products that they're selling but like you said the genericness or they have an idea of what they're moving oh no now i know the question okay mm -hmm. classes so you mm. mentioned like you like the name of a brand let's just pick on target for a second and say well we like the name target but what what happens if you actually you know maybe you're a shooting range and you actually sell targets and you want to you know use that and if you're registering in a different class can you still mm -hmm. register a same name now i mean target is a very big name so yes yeah yes yes it's yes and no so there are famous brands like target so when when there is a famous brand involved <laughs> pretty much uh it, it's <laughs> Well, I, I mean, the, more the answer is no, but let's say Target is not famous and they sell, I don't know, let's say they sell clothing mm -hmm. and let's say you want to sell targets, shooting mm -hmm. targets. The answer is yes, because there is no overlap. It's a totally different niche, mm -hmm. but let's say uh, they sell clothing and you want to sell bags. Mm -hmm. I mean, clothing and bags are related because they sold like next to each other uh, and they're like their accessories. Uh, so in this case, the answer is no. So even though they sell clothing, I mean, clothing and bags are really related. So it's a good idea well, to stay away. The same as like watches and jewelry. Yes. Uh, but if we were using something like, okay, Target sells clothing, but mm -hmm. I want to sell stationery, you know, with yes, that usually, yes, you can, you can pick a name uh, that's similar, uh, but it's still a good idea to do a trademark search. If a trademark is extremely unique and it's the only one out there, uh, it's still a good idea to differentiate because uh, there is no coexistence with other trademarks. So the trademarks office may still have a problem and not only the trademarks office, the company may still have a problem with your trademark registration, even though it's a different product. But usually, yes, you can. As long as there is no overlap, uh, you can pick a name that's similar or even the same, especially, oh, like, let's say a good example, Viking. There's so many Vikings out there, like Viking for this, Viking for that. Yes, they all mm -hmm. coexist peacefully on the register because people are so used to seeing Viking uh, for like different products. So yes, if you find uh, like a product for, and you want to name it Viking and it's not your trademark, yes, you can. I mean, it will be quite difficult, I think, but it's possible. Yeah. 
I, I totally understand that. So like, if you're, if I'm like, okay, this is a water bottle and I want to start a company called Viking water bottles, then there's no other Viking water bottles out there, then that, that might be registrable. But if you're using something like other people have had something very crazy. Um, and this is also why, if you've ever heard a brand name that you think is so bizarre compared to what they're actually selling, and it seems so disconnected, this is probably why, because mm -hmm. like, if you're, if you're, introducing an app or you're introducing like a similar but upgraded product from somewhere else you you know you can't descriptively trademark that so when you when you see different names for things that mm -hmm. seem like so bizarre like viking water bottle might not make much sense you know but at the same time like the the hydro flask is a great name yeah. for a water yeah. bottle because it, it it's congruent it makes sense mm -hmm. with that product but that can also depending on the uniqueness fall into that descriptive category. Yes, so right. the crazier you want to be, you know, that's that's the debate in marketing, right? Is people are like, well, we want the brand name to be so recognizable as far as what the product is. So like, yeah, that's a big problem. Yeah, because when you say hydro flask, like we all we can like mentally logically say hydro flask, it's probably mm -hmm. some sort of vessel to hold water or, you know, something like that mm -hmm. to where if it was called like the you know, swell bottles, if you've never heard of swell. And I said, if I told you swell was the name of a brand, what would you think the product was? People would be all over the map unless you've already yes, heard of exactly. it. So, if you can guess the product from the trademark name, it's not a good uh, yeah. trademark. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's a great way to sum it up. So it's like, <laughs> we kind of have to think out of the box because you know, it, it's, it can't be descriptive. If you have, you know, gum and then it says gum, you know, it's probably not going to be some sort of trademarkable because of the descriptiveness. So that's really helpful in clearing that up. The last question I remember sending from client that clients had sent in was like, how many classes should I register for? Because sometimes when people are starting, they, they might only be selling baby blankets or baby mm -hmm. items, but as they mm -hmm. grow, they're like, oh, wow, we realized we could start selling toys to toddlers as yeah. people grow with our brand. So how do you, um, do you try to register for everything in the beginning? Can you add classes as you go? Yeah, on? it's a good question. It's a painful question. Let's put it this way. So the short answer, like you should register uh, uh, as many classes as the budget allows. Uh, but the practical answer is one class is enough to get you in the brand registry to give you like minimal protection to like protect your name and to get you out there. Uh, so if you only sell baby blankets, I mean, don't try to think, oh, okay, what else am I going to think? If you have absolutely no idea, don't try to kind of squeeze in the class just because you can. Uh, it, you know, including the class just for the future use, it's usually never a good idea. It's easier to register a trademark in a single class. I mean, for some reason, the trademark office seems to like trademark applications in a single class. It's quicker, it's cheaper. It will still get you in the brand registry. It will give you protection. Uh, and then as you grow, uh, you can always file a second trademark. Unfortunately, you can't expand the existing trademark. You can't add to the same trademark, but you can file a second trademark for the same name for like different products and that's probably the best idea but it's not a good idea to file a trademark in 10 classes uh, we've had a few clients who did that and then only to delete nine of them because they never launched the other nine and it just costs you money uh, and it makes you really stressful you feel okay i have to start selling so it puts unnecessary stress on you and then when it doesn't happen it's just like a it's a huge expense really and just money wasted yes I, that's a great answer because I, I mean, I have only registered in one class and all of my different um, trademarks and that seemed to have been just fine. I haven't had any issues so far. Um, so, so that's a, a great, great advice. So thank you for all of your information. This is so informative and helpful for those of you who are on the fence about trademarking, or you're just feeling stuck and you're feeling like, I don't know exactly how listen to this again, because there's a lot, all the answer, most of the answers that you need in order to pursue your your trademark are kind of in this episode. We covered everything from creating and deciding what kind of brand you want to have and word marks plus, you know, logo marks. We talked about reporting violations and kind of all those things. So um, when you're ready to start working on your trademark for brand registry, um, I would love for you guys to be able to reach out to Trademark Angel. We love Anita and the team there and the team that she's built at her firm. They're very knowledgeable, very affordable and super knowledgeable specifically about Amazon brand registry 
and all of these things. And they can help you so much by that. So can you tell us where everyone can find you and how they can reach out for a consultation? Yeah, so you will distribute an affiliate link, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, full disclosure, you... full disclosure, yeah. we always use affiliate links for everything. Why? Because we want to be paid for our work as well. So you're welcome. Well, it's, and it's Mommy, a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Mommyincome.com forward slash trademark angel. And that's going to help you get to Anita and all of her place. Make sure if you give them a call, you can go to their website, trademarkangel. Is it .org or .com? dot com of course yeah, yeah dot, i know just making sure you never know <laughs> always get the dot com you guys always yes and by the way if you're going to register a trademark name always get the domain name it, it doesn't matter yes. if it's xyz gift company whatever go buy the dot com it's like eight dollars or something and yeah if, that's if, the first thing you should do yeah yes. when you when there is a trademark you like get the domain name yeah always get the domain name because you just never know if, if, when, how, or where you're going to need it or prove it. You can prove in use by using the trait, you know, all the different things, but you can learn more about that from Anita. So go to mommyincome.com forward slash trademark angel. And if you'd like to go to their website, trademarkangel.com, just make sure that you mention the Amazon files podcast, mommy income, whatever else. So that mm -hmm. Anita knows that you heard this amazing episode and want to work with her team. So is there anything else, any other place that you can lead them to for more information? So yeah, I just wanted to mention that you will get a discount if you mention my Circle, and they will get the credit. So it's it's a win-win, and I uh, I never paid a cent for uh, like advertising, uh, and I think I I want to reward like clients or friends or colleagues, you know, who refer to us, you know, their friends. Uh, so that's why yeah, it's a good idea to mention like how you found us. Uh, well, you can also find us on Facebook, uh, but I think it's easier on the website. There is a like contact us form and there is a free search form that you can fill and we'll do the initial trademark search for free. And you'll, you can also book a, a, phone, con a phone call consultation uh, where we can discuss your trademark and the preliminary results and like what package you need. Uh, so all of that is free, no obligation. Uh, and then we can take it further. But I think the website is the easiest to find us. Perfect. That was so, thank you so much for all of your time and your excellent information. I know I'm even more informed walking away now and uh, I'm sure everybody else is too. I got again, mommyincome.com forward slash trademark angel. Uh, you can also go to trademarkangel.com and fill out a form there. Just make sure you tell them mommy income sent you so that you can get your discount because we all love discounts, right? So great. Thank you so much for joining us. I know everyone could be anywhere else doing any other thing. I don't take that for granted. Thank you for listening to the Amazon Files podcast. Podcast, and we'll see you same time, same place next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, guys and girls.